My name is uh, Dan McGilvery. I'm Managing Director for Academic Relations at OCE and uh, Sector Lead for Energy and the Environment. And I want to thank you for joining us this morning at uh, the session that we've called Smart Grid Future for Ontario, the uh, role for private industry. As many of you know, uh, electric utilities in this province have laid out uh, their projected plans for implementing Ontario's smart grid and the need for contributions from the private sector and suppliers is becoming increasingly important. Uh, of particular interest is the inclusion of non-traditional industries into the electricity sector, such as telecom, IAT suppliers and energy management behind the meter service providers. So the purpose of our panel discussion today is to explore the contributing roles that different industries can play as we develop and unfurl this thing called smart grid. To help uh, guide us through this, uh, this uncharted water, uh, we have uh, OCE's chair of the board, Sean Conway. I have a very long bio on Sean, as you do in your thing, and he's told me specifically not to read it, but he is the chair of the board, so uh, for that, we'll give him full applause. Would you please direct your attention to Mr. Sean Conway? Thank you very much, Dr. McGilvery. Very pleased at the, uh, the brevity of all of that. I'm hoping I can follow your good example. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, joining us for, as, uh, as Dan said, a very uh, important and timely uh, discussion about the smart grid and particularly the role of the private sector in, in that. Uh, to, uh, the, we're very fortunate today to have four very serious, informed and knowledgeable um, personalities, uh, very familiar with this whole uh, space. The first presenter this morning, each of these presenters is going to take five, seven minutes to put some uh, ideas before this particular session, and we want this to be as interactive as possible. I know the panelists are going to oblige, so will you please welcome to the podium our first speaker from the independent um, um, electricity system operator, Don Tench. Don is the Director of Market Assessment and Compliance. He's also responsible for the Smart Grid Forum. Don Tench from IESO. Don? Well, thanks. Uh, it's, it's really great to be here this morning at, at this uh, conference. Uh, Sean and the organizers have asked me to provide a quick overview of the status of Smart Grid in Ontario, so I'll do that quickly and then we'll get to the uh, other uh, speakers and, and we'll get to the questions. But uh, it's no surprise that the electricity system in Ontario is uh, going through a profound, profound transition. I mean, we're, we're changing the way we uh, generate, manage, consume, and uh, value our electricity in the province. In less than two years, we've got uh, 25,000 homeowners, farm farmers, schools, businesses signed up to uh, develop their own renewable energy projects. Uh, many are up and running reducing Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions and other uh, pollutants. And in Ontario's installed the largest wind uh, energy capacity in Canada, and it's got the country's leading solar uh, market as well, with the largest solar voltaic uh, installation in, in Canada. Actually, the world, I guess. The province is also the first jurisdiction in Ontario to equip every home and small business with a smart meter. Uh, enabling widespread use of time of use rates, uh, time of use pricing that uh, allows the true cost of electricity to be seen by consumers. And uh, that's a pretty exciting time. If you've watched the media, you know uh, that's a change. Uh, a, a, I think a, a change that uh, consumers are adjusting to. Uh, at the same time as residential consumers are seeing time of use rates, the uh, large commercial and industrial facilities are lowering their peak time energy consumption by participating in demand response programs and uh, reducing the need and cost to build new generation. Uh, meanwhile, we've got the first wave of electric vehicles <clears throat> starting to show up and plugging into Ontario, uh, into household outlets and also uh, charging stations uh, with fleet operators. And uh, these changes are all part of a global trend. It's not, we're not, uh, Ontario's not operating in isolation here. Uh, a smart grid is uh, clearly a worldwide uh, development. But we do know that consumers are key to this. And uh, we know consumers, they want, to, they want to be able to safely charge their vehicles. They want to be able to reliably connect their rooftop solar. They want control over their energy bills. They want to make sure they can enjoy the features and benefits that come with smart appliances. 
And they also want to know that electricity services that they rely on every day in home, at work, are reliable and they're efficient and making good use of publicly funded infrastructure. So this, this, all of these things coming together has focused a spotlight on the smart grid, as, as uh, uh, Dr. McGillivray and Sean mentioned. And it's a term used to describe the, a reliable and fast adapting electrical grid that combines computers, communications, and t other technologies to safely manage the flow of electricity and automate many aspects of, of operation. And it's ultimately about using megabytes of data to move megawatts of electricity more efficiently and, and affordably. The Ontario Smart Grid Forum uh, recently released its second report. Now, for those who, who don't uh, know, the Ontario Smart Grid Forum was convened in 2008 in recognition of a need to establish a vision for Smart Grid and, a, and a begin facilitating its development. In early 2009, uh, the forum published its first report, which, which articulated a vision reviewing and, and reviewed the level of Smart Grid development activity in Ontario. And, and around the world, and it made some very specific recommendations that if Ontario wanted to be successful in, in its initiatives with renewable energy and demand response, we needed to spend some effort on the grid and uh, that, that uh, supports this, these changes. So we were, as I said, with this, we released a second report, and if you want a copy of it, uh, I'm shamelessly promoting it. It's uh, there's the ISO has a booth just behind us, uh, and uh, the we look for the Smart Grid Forum um, banner, and you can get a copy of that. Um, but this second report assesses the status of those earlier recommendations, identifies barriers that remain to implementation, and highlights cons the very considerable progress that Ontario has made in the last year and a half since the last report. That includes progress made by, the on by Ontario utilities, by government, by public agencies, by academia, and especially by the private sector. Uh, as an example, uh, I'll talk a wee bit about a smart home roadmap that's coming up, but it shows how development of a smart grid over the next 5, 10, 20 years will enable new technologies and service for the home. And, and that's, the fo that's the focus on the consumer that uh, I think smart grid I is, uh, is essential to, to the smart grid. Uh, the forum and its private sector partners define several smart grid success metrics as well, which I believe are, are really essential to measuring progress as the province's electricity system is modernized. In collaboration, with, as well in collaboration with government, uh, the forum established high-level smart grid principles that are being used to guide development uh, and rulemaking uh, by the Ontario Energy Board and others. And uh, members of the forum also formally recognize smart grid privacy principles, which are very important to building co consumer confidence in the uh, development of the smart grid. So while much has been accomplished, it, uh, the, the, the this report really lays out an action plan, an implementation plan. It's very much uh, in that form and uh, lays out where we think we need to go in for uh, modernizing the electricity grid. So it's clear, definitely clear, that smart grid is happening in Ontario. The smart home, uh, I think, is, is an area of particular interest to private development. Um, just in, in the report you'll see we, we try to graph, you can't see it here and please don't uh, try to do too much other than realize that it, it's, a, it's a road map that takes us from 2012 to 2030 and it lays out the kind of things that need to be accomplished to accommodate the kind of benefits that we see are achievable in Ontario. Uh, one thing to consider uh, is that uh, the smart ho smart meters and smart homes are quite different, and just as a uh, at a very high level, we've got more than four million smart meters in the province installed in virtu in, in every home, uh, and we've got more than half of those home homeowners on time of use rates. But the smart metering initiative was a very specific public infrastructure investment that was aimed at bringing benefits of smart metering to the consumers. And public utilities made those investments with many of the uh, technologies that you people have developed, uh, but it was guided by specific policy and regulation. <clears throat> but it was a very focused initiative. I think in contrast, uh, the opportunity for, smart, for the smart home is that 
It will be the electricity consumers and the choices they make which largely guide the development of the smart home. Uh, sure, utilities will play an, an important role as an enabler of customer choice. Uh, however, most of the investments are going in the smart home will come from consumers, and they're not going to be regu they're not going to be uh, public policy uh, that regulated distribution companies have to invest in. In other words, the investments in smart home functionality will be market driven, but at the same time encouraged and guided by policy and regulation. Modernization efforts are clearly underway in Ontario, and, and the government's a, a very positive supporter of this. The, the, their long-term energy plan will continue to drive this transition over the next years. The plan recognizes, this is the government's plan, recognizes that customer choice is expanding and the ar broad array of new energy products and services entering the market and which consumers increasingly demand are what, are, what is driving smart grid investments. And yet, much, much work remains in this, in this area. We do need more effective and coordinated efforts uh, to accelerate progress. Uh, we've got tremendous demand on the consumer side to install uh, renewable generation, for example, and uh, it's difficult to install at times because of uh, in the infrastructure that we're building, building out from. Uh, the long-term energy plan also highlights gaps that have emerged. Oh, I'm sorry, Our, the forums report also highlights gaps that have emerged just to ensure that the province can take full advantage of smart grid technologies such as distributed ener energy technology, such as distributed energy storage. And also new, new private sector entrants want assurances of a level playing field, um, such as getting access to, this, to the same inf uh, to electricity consumers and smart meter data that Ontario's local distribution companies have, for example. It's important. Once these and other issues are resolved, consumers will be able to fully benefit from the innovation and competition in the ele energy sector. And the various pieces of the smart grid also have to be, have to be carefully integrated. And that's, that's still very much ahead of us. So, the bottom line here is that the public sector investments will enable the, pub, the private sector spending, which in turn will really determine the, the evolution of the smart grid in Ontario. So we're on, on a trajectory of uh, building out the smart grid, modernizing the smart grid, and the, with the objective of reliable and efficient, an efficient electricity system and, and consumer choice. So thanks very much. Ron, how do you say it? Enbala? How do you say Enbala? Enbala. Thank you very much, uh, Don, for an excellent uh, scene setter. Now we've got three uh, speakers who will follow, all from the private sector, each with a um, slightly different uh, perspective and message today. The first uh, of the private sector presenters is Ron Dizzy, President and uh, CEO of Enbala Power Networks. Ron is a veteran of uh, the high growth technology industry. He is currently a board member of the Ontario Energy Association and vice chair of the Corporate Partners Committee of the Ontario Smart Grid Forum. Ron? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to take five or so minutes and we're going to talk about, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the Corporate Partners Committee uh, that you just heard about. The Smart Grid Forum was formed uh, 2009, right? And it was initially formed specifically without commercial interests, with a view that let's defy, decide what we want uh, unblemished by those people in business, which is probably a good idea. Um, but after they did that, and they kind of said, what is this thing, the smart grid? Smart grid's one of those things that could kind of mean almost anything. I think the smart grid forum produced one of the best definitions I've ever seen about what smart grid is and what it has to do. And there's three kind of major tenets to it. Consumer, uh, consumer choice. Um, adaptive infrastructure and utility flexibility. And if you think about it, those are three things that if we achieve the smart grid, we really will have done something. Uh, last year, about this time, they sort of said, okay, we've said what we want it to be, now we've got to figure out how to get there. 
And the Smart Grid Forum went to the OAA actually and said, could you help us put together a list of companies that will help us understand what are the barriers to actually doing business, to actually creating this thing that we're going to call the Smart Grid. And that was the, the Corporate Partners Committee was founded a, a, just about a year ago now. There's now about 30 members, like actually all these companies are actually members of the Corporate Partners Committee and I see a number of others in the audience, uh, Chris Reed from Energent and, and others. Um, and our whole goal is to take a very practical approach to what the barriers are. So our objective is to say, you know, this specific bit of policy, we can't access the data in the smart meter, for example, very well, and that's why we can't put home energy management systems in. Or um, we need to find a way to capture the value created by deferring capital costs in an LDC. And how do we provide that to people who can supply solutions to the electricity industry? So our objective is not to identify big, high-scale, you know, policy changes. It's to identify the little things that if we get these five things fixed, we could actually make a difference. And uh, this group has actually worked pretty hard and we end up just meeting as a group and deciding on four or five issues at a time. Somebody says, this is bugging me. If they put up their hand, that usually means they get to chair the subgroup, right, Chris? Um, and in, in a matter of a quarter or two, they produce some recommendations that go back up to the Smart Grid Forum. And you can kind of see the fingerprints of the Corporate Partners Committee in the recommendations that you're seeing in the Smart Grid Forum report right now. So that's what we're trying to do, take a very pragmatic and practical approach to what happens. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about now what the smart grid I think can mean. So, and I'm going to choose a particular element of it. Um, one of the things we've talked about and we think of as important to our changing energy mix is a change in the supply mix. So, you know, lots of people talk about it's good that we are getting off coal. You know, it's hard to argue that that's a bad thing. Um, and it's good that we're increasing the amount of renewables in our system. But when you do that, you make some really significant changes to how the power system works. And that's what this slide is intended to show. So, you know, everybody's used to the traditional demand curve night to day. And actually, the electricity system operator is pretty good at estimating what that will look like. But when you start adding significant quantities of intermittent renewables into a power system, what you get is more of this jagged line. I mean, I think it's amazing. These guys can tell you basically what the demand is going to be at 3 o'clock today. They know that already. They knew that last night. Um, what they don't know, though, if you've got a significant amount of supply coming from wind or solar, exactly when that's going to be there. And that creates really massive challenges in the power system. What most everybody intuitively gets, we need enough power. What not everybody gets is it's no better to have too much power in the system. And so you have to balance supply and demand in real time in a power system. Today we do that using supply. We literally change, I, you know, when I first learned this, I thought it was amazing. I thought somebody was like lying. But we change the output in Niagara Falls every few seconds to match the real time supply, real time demand in the power system. And what the smart grid will give us is new ways to do that. So there's a whole bunch of different approaches. One of them is to try to predict the wind or the solar before it happens. The ISO has got a lot of projects going on that. But there's also a real opportunity to use other elements in the smart grid. And we're talking mostly about loads to react to uh, what could happen. So we're going to talk a little bit about all the things that a smart grid could give you. So here's that same supply mix with the jagged curves all caused by having intermittent renewables. This, they're good, but they create new challenges. And, and let's talk about a bunch of these different things. We get peak challenges. It, it turns out that we haven't really had a peak problem since about 2007, I guess. The economy kind of took care of that for us, although the OPA will tell you it's all their conservation programs. Um, but it turns out a recession is probably the best conservation program you could ever put into place. Um, so there's still peak challenges though, right? So traditional demand response, how do we manage demand down? We've also got an increasing problem with surplus baseload generation. We run nuclear power plants. You don't turn off a nuclear power plant for the evening. Um, we've got must run hydro. You don't want to dry up or flood rivers. And what happens is in some days, especially in the fall and in the spring, we literally have times of the year where we've got less demand in the province than our, than our baseload generation. And honestly, as we keep adding wind, there's the possibility that that problem gets a little bit better, so, a little bit worse, sorry. So we have a surplus base load generation challenge. The power system fundamentally operates at about a 55% load factor. I mean, that's another thing. You kind of go, really, does it have to be that way? What if we could change when and how loads participated so we could make the load factor higher? We could use the existing infrastructure better. 
Um, electric vehicles are poised to create a challenge. Lots of question as to how fast that happens. But there's no question that when it happens, it will have a massive impact on the power system. The kind of the number is every electric vehicle is roughly equivalent to adding a house worth of electricity to a load. You can't do too many of those before you create big stresses in the power system. And then we talk a lot about, you know, the ability to adapt to stuff that we haven't even imagined yet. And again, a smart grid, a really intelligent grid gives you the ability to do that. So this is what we kind of show. That can be the vision, right? All of a sudden, demand matches supply instead of we always changing supply to match demand. I mean, that would be amazing. We flatten the load curve so that we have much higher utilization of the electricity system that's already in place. Um, we give ways to flexibly manage loads out of the peak and into the off-peak. And there's actually a whole bunch of different time frames where that makes sense. If you can even do that, shifting loads by minutes, you make the problem of integrating renewables a lot easier. It's called regulation services. And there's companies doing that already. Um, if you had loads that could be called upon, you could make the surplus base load generation problem essentially go away, right? All of a sudden, we can use the same amount of electricity or more closely the same amount of electricity all the time. That creates real value. And we create a platform that actually can adapt to, you know, future changes in the power system, future opportunities. And that to us is what this smart grid is. I think the smart grid is really about loads participating in the power system in very meaningful ways. When you think about it, that's what the smart grid's all about. So happy to answer questions when it's time. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Ron. I noticed uh, you got Jim's attention there at one point with a, a comment. I've asked these gentlemen to be a little spirited, so I appreciate uh, uh, that, uh, that approach. Uh, our next speaker from Siemens Canada is Dr. Yannick Juliard. Dr. Juliard? Thank you very much. So um, I think we've got a good vision about that we need to balance the uh, supply and we need to balance the demand and somehow come to new ways I, of operating the system. I've always been asked globally, what is smart grid? Is that an evolution or is it a revolution? And um, well, since I have a French background, I can talk a little bit to that. And I'd like to say, well, take care because revolutions always try to get rid of what is already existing. And I think we don't have that luxury to throw away the infrastructure that is there. Um, on the other side, it's going to be more an evolutionary path if we look into the power system uh, infrastructure. On the other side, I think if you want to do uh, what Ron has so fiercely explained, you need to come from a paradigm where you say, well, my power system is constructed like a waterfall. I have centralized generation. I have an infeed into the high voltage system, flows down to the distribution level, goes all the way down to the consumer, to a power system that got more infeed also on the distribution level. Um, because you have distributed generation, you have solar rooftops, you have all kinds of uh, new things coming on. Then you have electric vehicles that could act as batteries that need to be charged at times. And you've got a system in between that at this point of time is pretty passive. So one of the questions is, and here's the real revolution, this is how do we operate the power system in the future? And that needs to be a closed loop operations because you need to, to close the loop between the generation and the demand in real time. Now, uh, the next point about talking about smart grids is talking to different clients that we have, talking to different organizations we know, NGOs, but also political organizations. Until recently, when you talked about smart grids, you got a hand um, motion like this one. It's all very cloudy. And it means different things to different people. And uh, one of the things that we tried to do throughout the last a couple of months is to try to say, well, can we structure that a little bit so it becomes more tangible? So we've identified that we need to have smart generation because if we've got more intermittent power coming in on the other side, for the time being at the moment, you will need on the one side highly flexible thermal power plants 
and as well the integration of large-scale renewables um, feeding into the high voltage grid. You'll need smart transmission as well because the transmission system at times will get back feeds from the distribution level and the networks are not built for that at the moment. Uh, we are talking lots of the spaces into smart distribution systems because I guess a lot of the innovations will happen at the distribution level. Since distributed generation, electric vehicles and smart homes are connected to that part of the network locally. And then of course the whole system needs to have a smart consumption as well. And if you take the case of Denmark for instance, Denmark produces produced in 2008 20% of its energy uh, from intermittent resources. Unfortunately they don't have any mountains so they can't store it. This has led to a situation where you have 130% of production capacity compared to the, the demand in wind power and you create negative energy prices which was very happy for the Austrians because they said oh you're going to give us money to consume energy we're going to pump up the water the hill and the next day at the peak time when it's really expensive we're going to resell it to you so for us it's a double win situation you can possibly drive the Danish system in that way so the question is how do you have a clever way to use energy when it is produced and when it is readily available and this is the whole kind of thing about balancing supply and demand integrating distributed uh, generation integrating the renewable space but also doing something on the efficiency of the homes and of the buildings and I think the um, approach that Siemens has on the smart grid is that you need to think about generation to consumption and also about how to move the efficiency of the system and how to better utilize the assets that you have. One of the more interesting things if you try to do that is well we found that there was a lot going on in talks. In talks about objectives on a very high level in the political space, objectives that utilities and distribution companies would have, objectives that owners and vehicle operators would have. But somehow these high level ideas are very nice on a 30,000 feet level. The question is how do you land those ideas and how do they transform into tangible and implementable things. And this is where we began to create what we call a smart grid compass where we said you can really separate the space of the smart grid into five tangible um, sectors which is um, the network operations, it is the consumer service, it is the integration of smart energy devices where we mean smart generation but also smart consumption and electric cars and it is of course the optimization of the existing infrastructure and the usage of it which is asset and workforce management. But you got to take care because there is the nexus that you need to cover as well. And this is sometimes you got to think about how do I organize myself in a better way to respond to the new paradigm. And that's why we say a smart organization and change management is key to the success in the smart grid. And then <coughs> what was missing to our view to the market was something that bridges the objectives down to technologies. I've seen largely two approaches to smart grid. The one is you go the way to say I have high level objectives and I have big aspirations and I go that path, it's very visionary, but at the end with the implementation it gets a little bit, let's say bumpy to do it. Or on the other side of the extreme is I'll throw technology in the, at the networks, collect the data and somehow I will learn how to, what to do with all that data and what, how to better operate my system. And that's where we say the, really, the real benefit is to bridge those gaps. But really think about the objectives, how you need to make use of technologies so you change the processes in the utilities, in the public space to make better usage of the new technologies, integrate all that into a consistent framework. I'll give you an example. There is no use of having the smartest meter in the world if you do meter reading in the classical way. You've got to have a meter data management system to do that. 
Then the question is, if I have access to the data, can I use metadata for the operational space? Where is the synergy between the systems and how can I systematically identify it? If I have an outage somewhere, if I can ping the meter, I have a big improvement usually of my outage uh, management. I can guide my workforce better and if I better, have a better view on the asset side, what we have done to maintain this asset, what has gone on with reparations and stuff like that, you find synergies in the system. And the Compass is aimed at exactly this point, not to think only about the silver bullets of technology that are existing, but of the introduction and the infusion of technology into the processes of a utility or of a fleet manager to um, improve um, the business and to drive the value of the company. And this is, I think, what was the missing piece at the moment in the market. And we will be very happy to discuss that together with you. And I hope I've kept almost the time. Thank you very much. Uh, you have been exemplary both in the time and in, in the focus, and I thank you for that. Our last speaker uh, is Jim Alfred. Uh, Jim is the uh, Director of Product uh, Management uh, for Certicom, uh, a company that is considered the, legal, the leading global provider of elliptic curve cryptography, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of RIM. Jim has had over 14 years of experience with technical product development. Jim? Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Um, see if I can get to the slide, so that's me. And again, my talk today is really focused on ICT and, and mobilizing energy management and connecting the smartphone and the smart home. Uh, but in terms of talking about that, I think that it's important to, to understand the background, the ICT background, that's, the, the technology background that's driving this. So again, from my experience developing embedded smart embedded products, I have a pretty good uh, set of experiences with things like Moore's Law. What you can do with a microprocessor back when I started, I started in, uh, my first job was on a Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble Space Telescope, I was a software engineer. We we're building the point and control system for that. The flight computer on that was about, well, it was this big, that wide, that wide. That had the power, I think, of about an Intel, uh, not an 8086, an 8051. Right, amazing amount of resource constraints flying a, a spacecraft, pointing a spacecraft in uh, you know, a box that big, a computing platform that big, and now think about what we have today. So Moore's Law, Moore's Law has been driving this technology for about 40 years, hard to, hard to imagine that, but it's, Moore's Law has been going for 40 years. And, and Moore's Law is not a physical law, it's not a natural law, it's an economic law. If you think about what's driving Moore's Law, it's consumers, it's bringing the power of you know, ba basically silicon processes, driving silicon processes with consumer dollars. So getting the spending power of the consumer to impact decisions that companies like Intel make about their process technology, their process roadmap, and making uh, computing power affordable to the masses. So that has been going on for, again, 40 years. And, and as just after I prepared this, actually, I read an, an article online that said Intel, now with its, its fight with ARM for the mobile space, was actually, they've moved one, they just announced 3D transistors. They also just announced that they're going to leapfrog by one generation Moore's Law. So they're going to jump two, two cycles ahead with the next generation to go after ARM in the mobile space. You can imagine what that's gonna mean in terms of computing power for mobile devices. And all of that technology flows to developers of smart grid products, whether they're developing distribution automation systems or they're developing handheld devices. That, that investment in, in technology flows into, into those end, end products. It doesn't always flow immediately, and again, the slide, the, the little graph there from uh, Southern California Ed Energy shows how they, they treat technology. They really pilot very slowly and they plan 20 years ahead to see what kind of investments are they making now, or are they going to put a little bit of money, and how are they going to drive the technology forward. The consumer market, much different. It's driven by fashion and fad. Uh, and so you have the smartphone, which is, I think, today the leading driver of, of technology, things like Moore's Law. Again, you have Moore's Law, you also have Metcalf's Law. It says the, 
the uh, power of the network or the value of the network is proportional to uh, the square of the number of users. And, and today they say, well, actually, it's not the square. It's n times the log of n of the number of users on the network. But you can see what, what, what that means when you, put, you look at systems like the Internet and you look at companies like Facebook and the growing power they have in the marketplace because of the number of users they've attracted. So now you, you look at that and you say, okay, I've got this technology and it's moving into the smart home. And you, and you see announcements about uh, things happening in the smart home and, and shifts happening. So there was an article about Netflix now driving up the, they're, they're the dominant consumer of bandwidth on the internet today. So Netflix is a phenomenon that's just happened in the last couple of years in terms of how consumers uh, basically watch TV and watch movies. Now, they don't go to the, the video store anymore. They, they uh, simply rent, rent the, uh, the products online and, and deliver them over, over, over the top of their internet connection. So again, you have the smart home, and that is providing now anytime, anywhere control of your device, uh, of, of things in your home. And you connect that with the smartphone, and again, th this is the anytime, anywhere connection. Um, and, and again, there, there are applications today on the BlackBerry that let you control things like your garage door, et cetera, in your home. And there are companies focused on home automation that are building out these products. And again, in the Zigbee world for smart energy, those, those products are happening as well. And then, as I mentioned, in the ICT world, you see this happening at a much different pace. It's, it's much more slow. Uh, utility company, utilities are very conservative in terms of their approach to investing and rolling out new technology. And they're mostly concerned with security, scalability, reliability. So again, I mentioned the smart home and home energy management. Certicom's perspective here is that we're members of the Zigbee Alliance, and our security is used exclusively in the, in the Zigbee Smart Energy Profile. So the way this works is if you're building a Zigbee Smart Energy product, you actually have to take your product to a lab and get it tested, much like you have to take a cellular phone to the FDA and get it get FDA approved. Um, with Zigbee, you have to take your, your products to a lab, get them tested, get them certified. Once you get them certified, you can get a license from Certicom for a digital certificate. That digital certificate is put into your device, and only when your device has a digital certificate can it actually join the smart energy network in a house. So what that really does is ensures that all these products are compliant, certified, they work. It also adds a level of security, so it does automated uh, authenticated key agreement with devices in the network. So it basically keeps out the bad guys in your home area network without worrying about the WEP, WAP, encryption schemes. It's all built into the Zigbee Smart Energy devices. And then when you talk about those Zigbee Smart Energy devices, then you start seeing, well, okay, that's great. These devices are going in the home. How does that impact Smart Grid? What we're seeing now is new service providers coming to manage home energy networks, demand response programs, etc. So it's companies like Tendril Network, Networks and Converge that are coming in and, and helping the utilities manage things like demand response. And then following that, what we're seeing is also a trend where telecom service providers are coming in and saying, actually, I want a piece of this, and I want to manage home automation. And so their first thing is home uh, alarm systems, home automation, and then energy management. It's a natural bolt onto this. And it's an interesting observation that if the utilities don't want to do this, the, energy, the, the telecoms companies are more than happy to take this money. So that's an interesting piece of the, the market. Utilities are very conservative. They're watching, waiting. I think they're, they're soon going to be disintermediated, intermediated not just by this, but again, think about Moore's Law and think about photovoltaic technology. So look forward 20 years, think about Moore's Law, think about solar panels, and you know, think about the impact of that on the smart grid. So in terms of what RIM and Certicom are doing, so, uh, RIM just announced the, the, just launched the BlackBerry Playbook. You see there's an interesting new app with that. You can control the weather. <laughs> and Certicom, we're very active in smart grid and security standards, and again, building out, helping companies like iTron build security into their products. And uh, again, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jim and uh, colleague panelists, uh, for very good presentations. And that leaves us with half an hour between lunch. So now you've got to work. Um, I thought some 
obvious questions and commentary. So, one microphone, scores of people. Sir? I don't think the microphone's not for here. So um, one, one uh, industry that wasn't mentioned was um, construction or building, house building. And um, I wonder uh, how all of this, um, whether wireless will necessarily be the, uh, the, the platform uh, for delivering all this and whether a low powered or not low powered but low voltage wiring in the house with various outlets might also be a way of uh, of allowing interactions with the small grid, smart grid. Thank you very much. Anyone? Oh yeah, yeah. So I, I actually, it's a funny question. So I'm a big fan of wireless, but you know what I bought last weekend was a, a home plug, uh, basically a home plug network. And why? Because I can plug this into my basement. I can plug a little socket into my basement, plug a computer into that. Put it, and and again, it's things like Netflix that. Yeah, maybe I don't have a cable there, and I want to run Netflix to a to a, another screen. That's the ideal way to do it, and I don't have to worry about oh, you know, my my Wi-Fi connection dropped. I need to reconnect, which is what what happens with some of my products, where I, I'm not getting a good signal for or for whatever reason it disassociated. So I think power lines an obvious uh, an obvious technology. But but I guess my question is related to uh, zoning laws and trying to encourage all new builds or all renovations to incorporate this sort of technology that can anticipate future, um, you know, um, uh, 12 volt outputs, um, batteries on every floor, you know, that can be um, uh, charged directly uh, from the power line um, in off off peak hours. And, uh, I I don't think you're going to see that. I, I actually, one of the things we talk about the smart grid, there's, is every once in a while you hear about, you, you always hear about these uh, linkages to the internet. Um, but, and, and so people talk about the smart as though electricity will flow like bits, and it doesn't, right? Um, I, I think what you're not going to see is the information about the smart grid flowing over the electricity lines. I mean, that, I guess that could be one way to do it. But by far, the prevalent way that's happening is through overlay networks, if you will. So you use the internet, you use wireless, and I'm not sure there's any particular preferred way to do it. I just think it's whatever works for you. And I think the last thing you want is government to mandate one approach. I mean, that, that makes no sense to me. So I think, you know, use whatever makes sense in each, in each uh, con, you know, situation. And if a wired home makes sense, great. Wireless makes sense, great. I mean, wireless has the benefit of being, or power line has the benefit of being easy to retrofit, which you know, if we're going to achieve anything in smart grid, you can't be focused on new construction. You've got to be doing something that you can deal with in the existing building stock. Yannick? But, talk but uh, talking about uh, houses, one of the things that you will need, of course, um, is more efficient HVAC systems. I mean, in Siemens, we have an arm that uh, deals with building technologies. So what, what we show very much is you could be 30% more efficient easily in commercial industrial buildings and also in, um, in the homes. But that requires in-home communications as well. So you're going to see with the smart home anyways and in communication infrastructure that of course will be centered around what are the needs and what's the best way to do it in a retrofit manner. I don't think necessarily that the focus which is nowadays done on insulation is the only way to be more efficient in the in a house, especially not in uh, existing infrastructures that have destinies uh, on their back. Might be more um, efficient to invest into um, highly efficient heat pumps and HVAC systems. So, but that's an energy perspective on that. Yes, don't be shy. This is a subject that uh, both as uh, participants and as consumers, you're going to be spending more time and money around folks. So uh, we've got lots of good people in the room. Question? Uh, thanks a lot. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, in fact, I'm uh, heavily involved in the smart grid application and um, research. Um, I would like to uh, maybe clarify or rather have some discussion on uh, the comment that we do have existing infrastructure 
and we are going towards smart infrastructure. So uh, during this transition, uh, as uh, I think uh, Don highlighted, that uh, we do have clear picture about where we are going to, to, the, to go there now. My, my point of discussion is um, how can we learn from existing infrastructure in terms of quantitative analysis? What are the exact, exact limitations? What are the, um, the exact relative challenges? Um, as we mentioned in previous uh, discussions, in terms of uh, private industry, that we have a lot of money to be really invest for investment. H however, it is very important to prioritize this uh, while we are moving into during the shift. So um, whether we go um, 90 percent to uh, electrification of vehicles or smart homes or shall we do better into culture etc each one of these is actually investment and when we talk about the private sector role it is it is a sort of investment like if i'm doing research in the university i would like to take it into commercialization the industry would like to take role and the industry actually hearing something above which is a sort of directive uh, directions from government, I would say. So the the, I, my, my, the point is, how can we say that this is smart homes is is higher rate, or what is the ratio? What are the exact limitations? I I, I will be very happy to to see some discussions around this uh, in 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 details. Thank you very much, I, uh, Don. Don. Well, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to start this off. Um, it's a good question, and it relates to the uh, concept that the smart grid means many things to, do, to many people. In, in Ontario, um, and this is exactly the reason we formed the forum in 2008, because we felt that without some definition of where we wanted to go in Ontario, that we'd have exactly these questions, and we wouldn't have we'd have a, a variety of policies that maybe didn't accomplish the end result. So, so we did. We did. We we worked with industry, the the forum, and we worked with government. And in Ontario, the smart grid, I think, is is pretty well defined from the perspective you're looking for. And it it it, it encompasses three main areas: the customer control or customer choice, the um, adaptive infrastructure, and um, distribution flexibility or distribution automation. So those three areas, those three areas, and, and uh, think of them as equally weighted, I guess, because they're equally important uh, to achieving what Ontario wants to achieve, and that's that's part of our Green Energy Act now. Um, and in achieving those, uh, uh, in terms of, I think one question you raised, if I can just take a minute more, one question you raised was with respect to. Um, existing infrastructure and it's changing and, and in fact the smart grid is happening you know without policy without anything else because uh, utilities are investing in their infrastructure it's it's in many cases it's at reached end of life they have to buy new equipment well what do they buy they look around and they they buy the latest equip the latest equipment and then they integrate it uh, with all of its additional uh, benefits so uh, I think that that occurs quite naturally as as things get commercialized that the private sector develops and they they come become mainstream so uh, you know I would think of those three areas as equally weighted and certainly uh, it's happening uh, purely as a result of large investments uh, the LDC's have a, a infrastructure investment of 14 billion dollars in Ontario for example so a lot of that is uh, you know in, in being reinvested in Dr. Julia? Well, I welcome the question because, um, very honestly, that was the question that we were thinking of when we created the Smart Grid Compass. It was exactly this point about saying, what does make sense? Now, no, the vision is quite clear what a Smart Grid is, and I think, uh, like, um, like said, I mean, the, the three areas uh, that one can focus on in Ontario. But then the question is, where do I invest? Do I invest in smart homes and in efficient buildings? Do I invest into um, distribution automation? How is the synergy between them? What do I do with the metering infrastructure and how do I leverage that? And then of course the question about how can I improve my generation flexibility as well plays into the game. And what we have done there is to um, say we want to evaluate technologies and processes in order to create value. And uh, we have a value adoption program that we built in and we know it works quite well. You know why? Because we were using this program internally to optimize the company 
for the next last 20 years. So that's a little bit our answer to this point. But it's really good to see that uh, we have worked on the right questions, obviously. So thanks a lot for the question. Jim? Jim? Yeah, it is a good question. Um, two things that I'd like to say. One, I think the thing that I'm proudest of that the Corporate Partners Committee had done was focus, the first thing we did was focus on, so how would you measure that you had a smart grid? And again, if you read the smart grid form report, the measurements, how do you measure a smart grid are, are in there. Um, and, and that was one way to say, let's make sure we're doing things that actually add value to being in the smart grid. The second thing is, I'd say we're not doing the smart grid because it's a cool thing. We're doing it because it really makes sense for the next generation. Utilities will say, yeah, we're spending money on upgrading infrastructure, but we'd have to spend it anyway. And I think if you look at the incremental cost, which is the interesting thing, if the long-term energy plan is $90 billion, a couple billion of it is to make the system smarter. It's not like it's a small amount of money, but in the context of a big system, like you would never make a different decision than make it smart. And then I think what we need to do is rely on private sector, honestly, to do the things that make sense because they're economic, right? If I can go to Don and say, I think I've got a better way to supply regulation services, he'll buy it, right? And, and we don't need to, you don't, you know, I think we're in a bad position if we're, requi if we're requiring government or anybody to go and pick, let's do this and not this. We should let the economics drive it and let, let the decision-making process that already exists drive it. And I, I think that's where we're getting. I really do. Um, you know, smart meters created an infrastructure base and they were important. And while they get knocked as being expensive, they actually weren't that expensive in the context of the power system. And they just created a baseline measurement. They, they were possibly missold. But, you know, it, it, really, they're not a lot of money relative to the value they bring to the power system. Um. Oh, I'll have to restrain myself here. Peter Love from Ryerson University. Peter. The uh, uh, research fellow at Ryerson, former Chief Energy Conservation Officer of the Province of Ontario. Um, your last comment, uh, not very well sold, absolutely. Um, and I also like your comment that it, it is an incremental cost and people are putting the cost out of context. One of the things that I think is, is, um, uh, is frustrating, and I don't know if there's anybody from the Ontario Energy Board here, doesn't matter, I guess, but the, the time of use rates are the first thing that the consumers have seen and that's their, that's their that's their you know that's all they really know about this smart grid smart you know smart meter and one of the frustrations for me from the very beginning and it's gotten worse not better is that we started off at a three to one ratio between on peak and off peak and that's before any of the rates any of the meters were installed and as you know now it's about two to one um, so that so the the financial incentive to homeowners to actually do some of the demand response that, I, that the meter is al allowing them to do and in the, in the to get a better time of use signal has just been um, uh, heavily dampened. The other thing that hugely dampens it is the global adjustment because it is not based on time of use. So we, we've got this investment, it's tremendous, it's world leading. I, I, but the regulatory structure and the um, and the, and the, the the driver behind it, the, fun, the, the 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 costing behind it of the electricity, is just to me really frustrating that it's just not keeping up. And I've talked to the government about it, and they're saying, well, you know, we didn't want to really extend it too far. Maybe we'll do that a little bit in the future. But uh, anyway, I'd be interested in the panels or some of the panel's thoughts and on this. Is that uh, how important do you think this ratio of on peak off peak is? And where do you think it might go in the future? Thank you, Peter. Panel? Well, um, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps uh, from, from a global perspective, um, I'm a fan of Ron saying, Let, let's have the economics work. But the reality of it for most of the countries is that the regulation limits the economics to some extent. And um, so uh, what we are driving worldwide is initiatives to learn how um, in the new environment of a smart grid, how the players like the distribution system operators, the transmission system operators and the consumers need to work together in arrangements um, so they can make use of the benefits. Because one of the things, and I think smart metering is a classical example, um, if the benefits of the investments are on the other side of the, of the fence as the investment is, um, you run into trouble because you're not getting the synergy and you lose the gains in efficiency. 
So time of use terrorists, of course, we see them in coming in around the world. And one of the things that also needs to be done is education of the consumers. Because honestly, 15 years ago, who was interested in his electricity bill? It's a very high product, a high quality product at a very low price, comparatively low price, always available. And you got to make sure that if you make changes to that product, you bring the people along. Oh, very wise comments. Other members of the panel, Don and Jim, did you want to speak to this? Don? Uh, well, if I, uh, yeah, I'd like to just uh, comment on this. Uh, I, I, I agree. I think I agree, Peter, with what what you said. Um, recall in in 2002 when we introduced the electricity market in Ontario, we introduced uh, retail competition as well. In other words, people paid the price of electricity uh, when it was as it was generated. So never mind time of use rates; it varied each hour, or actually varies every five minutes. But um, there was a consequence to that. I think uh, you know the, prov the the consumers weren't ready for that, and there was there was a backlash. And uh, I think we've we've managed to move to time of use rates. Um, and uh, I, it's it's certainly a step in the right direction, but it's not the end end of the path. But I think we have to consider uh, we ha we have to bring the, the it's the consumers that have to pull this along rather than us pushing it to the consumers, and we're not there yet. And I think that's very much a, an education piece and, a, and an awareness piece that over uh, that that we need to focus on and and try to accelerate. But I think uh, reality is uh, consumers weren't ready for uh, strongly varying prices, and we need they they need to see the benefits of that. Jim? Yeah, sir. So. Let's see if I'm on here. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I guess one perspective I have, I, so the recent smart meter rebates, I think, are one of the worst things that could happen in terms of making the most out of the smart metering investment and engaging consumers, because there was an opportunity to essentially put a bit more money into the system and actually turn your smart meter into something that could provide real-time feedback to consumers and engage them. And add that to the mobile device. You know, people aren't sitting in front of the thermostat to look for their price signals. But they are very much attached to their mobile phones. And they would gravitate to that. So a system where you can engage consumers to what's happening in terms of real-time pricing and, and uh, you know, real-time how much consumption they're, they're, they're having, I think that's something that would dramatically change uh, how consumers use energy and get them engaged in this. So it's that whole smart home vision is kind of stopping today at the Ontario smart meter. And, and I think that needs to change. Sir. Uh, I'm going to move up to the larger buildings. I'm David Katz, and I'm with the CABA, the Automated Building Association. I'm also on the NIST Building to Grid uh, Task Force for SGIP. What we find is that in other jurisdictions, uh, the price of electricity, like in Europe, is much more. And so how can we address this differentiation that our peak is so low and yet we're giving money for demand response and in New Jersey or somewhere else, it's a much different price signal. And so how do we educate people that it's not about the price on the bill today, it's about the price of the future? How do, how do we bring that to the, to the smart grid? Because the jurisdictions are trying to set standards with Siemens who are on you know smart grid, but what you do in Europe Maybe technologically the same, but how would it fit in the Ontario, you know, political regulatory pricing scheme? How, how can we bring that price issue of electricity to the smart grid because it differs so widely? Thank you very much for that. Can I add a supplementary because I I um, I'm really interested uh, in this and a couple of the earlier points. So, can I just make a couple of other observations? One, um, you know, Yannick, you told a great story about the Danes and the Austrians. I'd like to have been around for the day two and day three of that discussion. I can just imagine. How does this work again in Copenhagen? We do this so the gang in Vienna can make money at, and I'm sure it all got worked out, but I suspect there was, uh, there was some fireworks. Um, the, the last question, I mean, one of the, surely one of the bedeviling factors is that Ontario and Canada in this business of electricity is a culture, are a culture of plenty. It's absolutely true, prices in Tokyo and Paris and uh, you name it, New York are here, but 
clearly God put Canadians on the earth to enjoy forever cheap, available, homegrown electricity. And uh, those poor Europeans and the poor Asians, well, that's just the curse of bad geography, I guess. And I'm only being partly facetious. One of the concerns, I, I did spend some time in politics, and I, I'm a big, I think the smart grid is a great idea, uh, but we have had for a hundred years a certain paradigm. Big generating operations, relatively few in number, and a big one-way highway, essentially. So now what we intend to do, for all kinds of good reason, and if you've ever been involved, forget electricity. Think of your neighborhood in urban Canada. Have you ever been involved in one of these discussions where you're about to take a few two-way, well, one-way streets and turn them into two-way streets, or better still, particularly if you live in Ottawa, everything is a one-way street. We are about to change, uh, thinking about surface transportation, a lot of one-way streets into two-way streets. I think it's a good thing in macro terms. I have a funny feeling, given my previous life, there are going to be a lot of meetings about just how this is all going to happen. So one of my, one of my concerns here is, this is a good thing, we have to do it, as Peter indicated, it's underway. There are clearly going to be some barriers, whether it's the culture of plenty, whether it is geezers like myself, at 60, I'll probably be a lot happier if I've got a 25-year-old around because I watch the kids today on telecommunications and boy, that's taught me some very important lessons. But there better be some under 25 folks around when this stuff has to get integrated because I'm afraid, panel accepted, a number of people my age are really going to be at sea wanting to know how we can actually get around these minor little barriers that if they're not dealt with are going to put me in the cold. So how do we confront and deal with barriers? Because we've got 13 million consumers at the, at the end of a lifeline that's delivering a very critical resource. Any comment? We can start maybe with the pricing regime that is this, as I like to say, culture of plenty problem. I'll just give a premise. I used to be with Ontario Hydro. I had to justify the retubing of Pickering. I worked with your boss, Paul. So we made it too cheap to meter. And I'm sitting on this U.S. committee with Siemens gentlemen from, and the dichotomy of, well, we would never do that because it wouldn't be economic. Solar, we, we're, we're paying 80 cents on the roof and people can't believe it in other jurisdictions. So when do we bring the real price issue to bear? Because the technologies that we learned isn't just the issue, it's about who's gonna ultimately pay for it. And so it, the, although the smart grid wants to be standardized, I don't think Siemens wants to make 16 different boxes. Zigbee is approved, but there are other wireless. How do we bring the price issue to bear? Great question. So Panel? that we have a smart grid that's global as opposed to local. Easy question, relevant <laughs> question. Dr. Juilliard? Well, let, let me give it in a, in a two-folded approach. I'd like to give you um, an example from another area, how it could work. Um, I don't know how much the thing is about organic foods in Canada nowadays, but we've seen organic food shops popping out of like mushrooms, like nothing, coming out over the last 20 years. You, you know, 30 years ago, my parents used to say, you know all those muesli eaters? They don't, they don't look very healthy. <laughs> now, um, what's changed now is, uh, I talked to my, my ma uh, yesterday on the phone. She said, well, I went to the organic shop because I think the, the thing tastes better and it feels better. Um, so that's one, one point. Another one was, um, and I said, well, you pay more for it and electricity needs to go that way as well. Another one was an experience that I was taught by uh, somebody in the French government that was responsible for getting recycling bins in France. And I mean, recycling bins in France 10 years ago was something like, what should I do? Recycling my waste? Um, now it's come to a point that he gets um, questions from communities that haven't got that to put that in because people want to do it. And the lesson I think is people want really to do a contribution to a greener planet, if you would ask them, but you, they need to have a transparent way to communicate with them over easy, modern technologies, what their contribution to that really is. 
and that's one of the things how you could raise the awareness that's kind of a social engineering and the other type is of course to make aware that electricity is a very high quality Value product, product. Um, and that is not easy to, to do right Ron yeah so, so one of the things I think we have to make sure we don't do is let elect there's only two ways to pay for electricity it's in the rate base or it's in the tax base and it's kind of the same people um, so I think we got to make sure we keep the cost of electricity in the rate base. I think the other reality kind of goes to one of Peter's questions. So I think every time we move stuff into the tax base, and frankly, the tax, you know, you sort of raised it, the tax rebates are one way to do that. that that's a bad thing because we take away completely price signals. Um, a, a couple other comments. I mean, Peter raised the, you know, what's the price differential need to be? I think the studies say it needs to be four or five to one. The problem is anytime anybody comes close to that, they lose the next election, so it never lasts, right? You know, there's, there's, so that's a challenge. Um, the other thing, I'm, I hear and see different things in terms of rates. I think we pay in Ontario not that much different by the time you put all in costs of electricity from a lot of the northeast areas anyway. I, I, maybe a little bit more, but it's not way, way more. So I see similar decisions made by CNI, and I'll, let me go a little further. I think one of the challenges we have is electricity is cheap enough that for most people, it's not a big household expense. You just don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. CNI, you, you, we end up talking to people who are the energy manager. So there's a guy who actually cares about it, and they will make different decisions. Well, that we work with the CNI group. We yeah. try to get the Green Building Council to recognize, just to go back to this gentleman about construction, we're making green buildings dumb. We have lead EB that's going around and doing good things for the, the, the lead part, yeah. but we're not making them smart. So I'm just hoping that interoperability between the green issues, the smart issues, the technology issues. Yeah. And bring it together. One of the That's things that commercial buildings do have a different challenge, which right. is that very often the owner and the guy who pays the bills exactly. are not the tenant. Right. So you actually have a disconnect in the economics, right? Maybe when I say C and I, I particularly lean to okay. I because owner occupied buildings, you get very different changes the in the way people versus. perceive the economics. So I, I think that is a different problem. The tenants pay the electricity bills, the owner doesn't. You know, through their part of the rent, nobody, they don't feel they can make a change. And that's why you have building automation systems that don't actually change after the day they turn okay. on the lights for the first time. Jim? Yeah, I, maybe I didn't understand the question, but I guess I think it's a, maybe it's a bit of crazy talk to think that electricity prices in Europe should somehow uh, mirror electricity costs in Canada or vice versa. I think there is an opportunity if electricity is so cheap in Canada to, yeah, again, I think it's already exported. The other is to build up industries that rely on cheap electricity. So those things to me seem to be economic things. And naturally, the rate, the rate payers want to have affordable electricity. I think smart systems can help them manage that consumption. Smart buildings can help uh, building owners manage the costs. But I think, again, that there's no reason for me to believe that a, you know, Canadians should pay the same as Europeans for electricity. But surely the issue there on price has to be, it's also a policy consideration. If I'm in Ontario and I decide for good and virtuous reasons I'm getting off coal and going to relatively high priced intermittent renewables and my competitors in Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan and uh, Pennsylvania decide to, for whatever good or bad reasons, stick with hydrocarbons and my friends in Quebec and uh, Manitoba have no little bit of cheap legacy hydroelectric, uh, I've actually got a price issue that's uh, quite beyond smart grid, don't you think? Don? Well, sure, and that's, a, and that's, that's an excellent debate we could probably spend the afternoon on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, in terms of pricing, I, I guess I, I'm with uh, some of the others that we should celebrate the prices that we have in Ontario for the time being. Uh, the elephant in the room is carbon pricing. And, uh, you know, Ontario is taking a proactive approach in advance of uh, recognizing carbon prices in, in the uh, electricity industry. So our prices aren't going to stay low. They're, they're going to go up, uh, and there's no doubt about it. And uh, when they do go up, then they'll probably, uh, consumers will become more, more interested in them than they are today. Last word to, uh, to Dr. Julian. Well, um, just one of the experiences we, ha we had in um, making a green city assessments around the world. 
There's one thing you slightly overlook somehow, the one is carbon pricing, and the other one is um, cities in the future are going to have a debate and a competition amongst themselves about their green index, because it's going to be increasingly chic to live in a green city, and this is why all of the major mega cities are going to, for improvement program on that area. And the electricity um, industry is, of course, part of that one. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Juilliard and Don and Ron and Jim for uh, a very good and lively presentation. Thank all of you. With Dr. McGilvery has some things he wants to present. And uh, when Dan is finished, I want to thank the panel. Lunch is served in a few moments' time, not very far away. Thank you. I want to thank Sean as well. That was, uh, that was a great, and it, they really got revved up at the end there. Uh, I, I also want to acknowledge uh, Gowlings, who actually sponsored this theater. And I, I learned four things I just want to highlight for you. We've, we've got the Smart Grid Forum reports outside the door. I heard things about smart balance between supply and demand. I'm amazed to actually learn that the, uh, the tablet from, from BlackBerry controls the weather. That was fantastic. And I'm, I'm now I've got to get one because, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's critical. And don't lose sight of that smart grid compass. I think there's a lot of direction in what I've, I've heard from that. Um, as Sean just said, uh, lunch will be served uh, just in the hall out this way, and uh, the Honorable Glenn Murray will be speaking. He's the Minister of Research Innovation at lunch. And uh, I also want to draw your attention to the uh, smart grid security and privacy session that's happening this afternoon after lunch. You can find it in your agenda. And uh, I'm also going to uh, pass out a little token of our appreciation to the panel right now, but uh, run off to lunch and thank you all for your participation in this conference.